morning. Welcome to Burnaby Christian Pentecostal Church. Boy, uh, it's good to see you guys here today. Let's stand. We're going to worship the Lord. So we welcome you today. We want to give God praise because He is worthy of our praise. We're happy we can meet in person, worship together. And we have to be careful about the singing, but worship along with us. And let's just give Him glory today. Oh, 
Is he well worth it?
just lead us in this last song.
you hear us, we pray, dear Lord. Thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness, your love, grace, and mercy, Jesus. And Lord, we ask you, please forgive us, oh God, for our sins, for our mistakes. We acknowledge our frailty and our shortcomings. And please cleanse us from all the righteousness of your grace and forgiveness, we pray. And dear Lord, pray right now for the needs that are represented. You know what they are, dear Lord. Physical, financial, spiritual, emotional, whatever the situation is. Please supply every need, dear Jesus, we pray, according to your riches and glory, is what your word declares in Philippians 4.19. We trust in you, we trust in your word, dear Lord. So meet every need, work all things out for our good, and for your glory. We love you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, in his mighty name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Before you do, turn around and say, hey, good to see you. I know we can't shake hands, but just greet somebody this morning, be friendly. And I want to just jump right into our, our message for this morning. We're doing this series in Timothy. And uh, it should be right there, and you should have it there uh, on our PowerPoint in just a moment. But we're in chapter 3 as we're continuing our series on truth with Timothy. And they were planting churches throughout the Roman colonies. And because Israel and Judea and Samaria, they're all under Roman rule, right? So they were planting churches, and Paul was mentoring Timothy. Timothy was, uh, he was like me, a dual citizen. I have an uh, American mother, and my father was Canadian. Uh, so basically, Timothy was dual citizenship. He had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. And so just to make sure that everything was on the up and up, and there was no question to his commitment to uh, doing the right thing. He was circumcised even as an adult and uh, they went around and started to plant more and more churches but then Paul got locked up in prison. But that didn't stop Paul. He began to write letters to encourage the churches that he had planted. That's where we get all these Pauline epistles. The books in the New Testament like Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, these are all towns and these are churches in those towns that Paul was writing letters to to give them instruction and encouragement and help them along because there are brand new churches with elders, basically volunteer pastors that were put in place of these house churches. And so we're getting these letters and Timothy was written to Timothy who he had put in charge of the church in Ephesus. So all of a sudden he's got this congregation he has to be in charge of. And so we're going to pick it up here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We won't read the whole chapter. We're going to read a portion of it. And uh, I love this this great book because he's learning and he's passing on what he learns to the people there. So this is what it says, beginning with verse 1. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, and able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, but one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Then pick it up in verse 13. For those who have served well as deacons, deacons and bishops were a similar role, a little different, but a lot of overlap there. So the same principles apply. They obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. So, let's just have a word of prayer as we jump into this here today. Lord, we thank you that you are with us right now. Lord, you tell us when we gather in your name, you are here in our midst. And besides that, we know that you are with us every day, Lord, because we have your Holy Spirit living in our hearts and lives. So bless this time. Help us to understand what you are saying and to put it into practice in a practical way that we can live pleasing to you, Jesus. Use us to do great things for your kingdom, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. So, number one, as we start off this morning, a Christian leader will model good behavior and self-control. 
Now, you're saying, well, Pastor Scott, I'm not a leader. You know, I'm not a pastor or a teacher. I go to work or I go to my job and I'm one of the employees there and I, I try to do well, but who said I'm a leader? Well, here's the thing. Everybody can lead somebody. In fact, if you look at the Great Commission that Jesus gave just before he went back up to heaven, after he had risen from the dead, he was hanging out on earth for about 40 days with the disciples, and, and then all of a sudden he just about ready to depart and ascends back up to heaven with a promise that he's coming again. He tells the disciple, now go into all the world teaching them, for I have commanded you. And that commission is not just for the 12 disciples, it's for every Christian believer. So you don't have to be a full-time teacher to be able to mentor somebody. If you believe that, say yes. Yes. See, I didn't say amen, right? Amen's old school. Yes, we'll do school. We'll do a mix of both. But it'll keep you on your toes. So all of us basically are called to, to mentor somebody, just like Paul did for young Timothy. I mean, this guy could have gone either way. He was a new Christian, and he had a good reputation, but he was young in the faith. He could have been influenced through maybe his father's side of things because the Greeks, they were into polytheism, which is multiple gods, multiple deities. And yet, Paul saw potential in him, so he took him under his wing. Everybody can have somebody. You say, well, Scott, I've only been like a saved for one week. You know what? You know more as a one-week-old Christian than somebody who's never met Jesus. So you can teach them how to know Jesus. That's teaching. And then you can mention them a little bit. So whatever you do know, try to pass it on to somebody else. And God will give you the right opportunities. You can't force on anybody. But just build bridges into people's lives. Be a friend. Be loving. Be kind. Shine your light wherever you go. And the Lord will give you opportunities to be able to invest into somebody else. So everybody can lead somebody. And a Christian leader will model that good behavior and self-control. I put a picture of my dad up here because it is Father's Day. And so every father is called to lead and mentor God's love to their families. That's really our Christian mandate. Now, it doesn't always happen as it should. But for those Christian dads, praise the Lord for the fact that they are endeavoring to lead their family into the truth of Jesus and His Word. So this was my dad. And uh, we did look fairly similar. I'll, I'll give you that. Uh, he was a little tall. He was a big guy. He was six foot four. And, uh, and he was a pastor as well. And he was crazy. He had this big heart, big loud voice, big personality. You know, like when he walked in the room, you could just hear his voice carrying across the room. My mom would say she could hear him on the other side of like a department store. Because he'd be talking real loud to the people like that. And his voice just carried. But without the mic, right? His voice just carried. It was strong. It was loud. But it was great because he was a pastor and a preacher. So it helped, you know, when he needed to get people's attention. And so he was this big, gregarious guy. He passed away 11 years ago. Um, I miss him every day. But I know that my earthly father is hanging out with my heavenly father. And I know I'm going to see them both soon. And I'm looking forward to that so much. But so my dad would do these things like he kind of had battled with his weight for most of his life. And, and now I do too. And I got the same genes. So I have to try to watch what I eat. And it doesn't always go well. But my dad was big. And so he battled his weight. So he and my mom would go on these diets. It would last about a week or two. And say, Scott, we're going to like ride our bikes. But they got into bike riding. And my dad bought some bike shorts. And it was not a pretty picture. I'm just, I'm just going to leave it there. But he had bike shorts, and they were biking around town, but they would bike to McDonald's and then get, like, ice cream or apple pie. And so it just was kind of a wash, right? They canceled each other out. They would burn a few calories, and then they would just eat them right back up. And so, uh, you know, that was my dad, and they would go on a diet, and then after a while, they'd go off the diet, and they'd hit the, hit the smorgasbord, the all-you-can-eat buffets, and go back on the diet. So kind of every other month, it was some sort of a new program. But you know what? He loved life. He lived life to the full, and uh, he was a great guy, and a man of God, and he modeled good behavior. He never claimed to be perfect. I know my dad wasn't perfect. He had flaws, because he was human, and we all have flaws. Amen? But he could say, just like the Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And he led us to follow Jesus. And he led us to live the word, live our faith every day. And we're going to make mistakes, but that's where we rely on the grace and the forgiveness of God, the goodness of God. He loves us and he forgives us every time. But he would model that behavior. And so one of the things that Paul talks about is practicing self-control. 
so that we're not violent or quarrelsome or excessive. Um, and, you know, there, there's different views on drinking, and I know a lot of Christians uh, do, you know, drink in moderation, and, and, you know, it's in the Bible. We know that Jesus turned water into wine. That's between you and the Lord. I personally don't drink, but that's, that's up to you. But we're not to get drunk. That's very clear. And also, we don't want to be a stumbling block for anybody else. So you have to be very careful as a Christian believer, if you're out and you choose to drink, that you don't cause somebody else, a weaker Christian brother or sister, to stumble. Because maybe they're on the wagon. Maybe they're a recovering alcoholic. So these are things you have to be mindful of. So just use wisdom when, in regards to those issues. But uh, we have to make sure that we're not doing things in excess, whether it's drinking or eating or anything. Not quarrelsome, not violent, but applying the truth of God's Word so that we're living a good, godly life. And that's our goal, right? We want to be more like Jesus every day. Anybody besides me are working towards that, right? And, it's, and we're not perfect, but it's not about perfection. It's about our direction. You've heard me say that again and again. Are you following Jesus as your Lord every day? Moving forward, following Jesus as Lord. Your direction is following Him and living for Him every day. So I like what Psalm 5.3 says, because if we're going to model good behavior and self-control, we're going to need the help and the strength of the Holy Spirit. We're going to need God's wisdom and His strength, because we can't do it on our own. When Jesus was having His last supper with the disciples, look at John 14 and 15. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, but I'm going to give you somebody, who will, the counselor, the comforter. Uh, in the Greek, it's paraclete. That means one who comes alongside. It's like, let me help you with this. And so that's why he gave us his Holy Spirit. He said, I have to go so that he can come. And he will guide you in all truth. And then we wait upon the Lord by spending that quiet time with Jesus every day. Because that's when we can just uh, kind of rest. Turn off the television. You know, put your phone on mute. Get alone for 15, 20 minutes. Maybe it's in your bedroom. You know, your prayer closet, maybe it's hanging out in the living room on a comfortable chair. It might be the first thing in the morning or the last thing at night. When I was traveling years ago in full-time music, a group called the Heritage Singers, and we were doing a whole bunch of concerts every year. So we were, we were going to stay in the hotels. We had a big Silver Eagle road bus, and we'd do the concert, then we'd tear down equipment, then we'd travel to the hotel, we'd spend the night, and then the next day we'd get up and roll it out again to the next town. And it was a neat experience, but it got tiring. But you're always with people. Like, you know, I'm, at night even, the hotel rooms, there's two per room. And so I was bumping with somebody. And during the day, you're on the road bus, and, and you're doing concerts, and you're setting up, and then you're tearing down. And you're always with people, people, people. And that's great, but when do I get along with God? So what I did is at the end of the day, after the concert, after we torn down, after we got in the hotel room and we'd eaten and we're all done, I would basically go into the bathroom and shut the door and have my little prayer closet there because it was the only alone time I could really get. And that's when I had my personal quiet time with the Lord, a little Bible reading and prayer. And, and you know, it wasn't fancy, but just my time. And I remember it spoke to one of the guys, his name was Roger, and he was a, a fellow from Trinidad, from the West Indies, and a tremendous piano player, fantastic jazz piano player. And I wasn't trying to press it. I was just trying to make sure I was keeping my own spiritual walk going. Because it's hard when you're busy and you're always on the go. And I remember saying, Scott, I think that's cool how you, you know, have your prayer time at night. And you just go into the washroom and, and just kind of get along with God. And it kind of inspired me too. I remember him saying that. And so, praise the Lord, any, anything positive. Because I'm sure I made plenty of mistakes too. And things that he wouldn't want to copy. But that was something that he did want to adopt and adapt to his life. Um, let's shine wherever we go and let's have quiet time with the Lord. Psalm 5.3, this is what David says, My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you and I will look up. David's saying, I'm going to be calling out to you in the morning, God. Get ready, you're going to hear my voice. Psalm 119.105, then how do we, we also need to spend time in the Word. It says, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So you're going to hear my praise, and I'm going to read your word, because it guides and directs my life every day. So we're model good behavior, but we need his help and strength. So wait upon the Lord every day. Number two, a Christian leader will have a good testimony with unbelievers. A good testimony with unbelievers. <clears throat> 
This is not always easy to do, right? I mean, this is our goal. We want to make sure that we're shining bright for Jesus. But sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we mess up. And, uh, you know, are you like me? Have you ever been driving? And maybe you accidentally, inadvertently cut somebody off. You didn't quite give enough room, you know, when you were changing in their lane. Or, or maybe they made you mad or you made them mad. But, but uh, you, you kind of, you know you're frustrated. And somebody honks your horn. Or, you know, maybe they do one of these. Like, what are you doing? You know that you ticked them off or they ticked you off. Anybody but me ever, you know, have a little tension on the road? Come on, let's be honest. I want to see those hands. Let's be honest. Yeah, thank you. I'm in good company here. I'm not the only one. And, and it's going to happen. Now, you know, if you take off somebody and, you know, they might give you the, the finger, right? And, and as Christians, we're not supposed to do that. But maybe you just do one of these, you know. The, not, not the finger, just the hand. That's right. Just, you know, but I can let them know that I'm upset. Or you toot the horn. Well, and so you do this and all of a sudden you pull up to the light. And you have to like pull right up next to them. And they're like in the changing lanes. Like, oh, okay, now this is awkward. We were just like arguing on the, on the road. And now we're stopped at the traffic light. And it gets real awkward. You maybe kind of back up a little bit or go a little forward so you don't have to look right into their eyes. So that's one of the negative things. Now, the positive thing, I don't know if you've learned this trick, but uh, it's something that I picked up is when, when the emergency vehicles are coming along, and this has happened to me the other day on, on Highway 15 as it turned off of, of Highway 1 and heading back into Cloverdale there. And sure enough, the ambulance is coming, so everybody's pulling over. But then the ambulance passes you by and you realize there's no other emergency vehicles coming. I hop back behind that guy and just let him take me all the way through. Now we're just burning by people, right? So that's one of the little tips you can take from Pastor Scott today. Get behind the emergency vehicle, provided there's no other vehicles coming. And they're just like, you just basically are just ghosting them, right? You're, you're uh, just drafting them as the driving term if you're in the NASCAR. You draft them all the way and they just lead the way. And it's like dividing the water. So it's pretty cool. But... We can be a positive testimony or a negative testimony, right? And that's our goal is, is to shine bright. Matthew 5, 16, uh, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's our goal. We want to attract people to Jesus, not repel them away. We want to draw people to Jesus by the things that we say and do, our loving, uh, our kindness, our goodness, uh, our generosity. As we model Christian behavior to others, they're going to see Jesus in you. So not everyone will understand your priorities to serve Jesus. They might not understand your fundamental beliefs, why you go to church on Sunday, why you don't do certain things and you do do other things, and what you hold dear. They don't get all that. But you know what they will understand? Somebody who's kind, somebody who's trustworthy, somebody they can count on, somebody who helps them in, in their time of need, that's going to speak volumes. See, that's shining light into their life, right? And that's what God has called us to do. That's what Jesus, our Lord, has called us to do, to be His hands and His feet and His voice, to be His ambassadors, representatives to our world. So a Christian leader will have a good testimony with unbelievers. This is what Paul is telling Timothy. He said they'll have a good testimony. They'll have a good reputation for those that are outside, he's talking about those that are outside the church. The church family should know them pretty well, right? Like I, I know people in our church and I've already, even at our almost seven months here, man, it's gone by quick already. Uh, you know, I've gotten to know some of our key people and know who I can trust and count on and just love this church family, awesome congregation, and we're getting to know each other. But what about people outside these walls? And how will they get to know us? What kind of testimony will we have? And that's what we need to remember, that we are representing Jesus. So shine bright for Him. Now, Jesus had His inner circle of friends. Anybody know who they were? Twelve disciples, right? They were His compadres. That was His posse. That was His close friends, right? The twelve disciples. So they would break bread together. They would travel together. I'm sure they had lots and lots of conversations. And obviously, He was the one mentoring them. But I'm sure it brought some comfort to Jesus to have people around him because he wasn't married, right? He was out there on his own. So you want to have somebody to travel with, to encourage each other, to strengthen one another. And so those were his close circle of friends, were the 12 disciples. However, he also would spend time with sinners. He would hang out with the tax collectors who in Hebrew times were a despised group. 
because they were basically employed by the Roman government and they were taxing their fellow Hebrews, their fellow Israelites. And sometimes they would cheat on their taxes and they would pad it and they would add in their little percentage over and above. And so people hated the tax collectors. I don't know, uh, we, we won't get into that today, but let's, let's, let's be nice to the CRA, okay? They're doing their job. So uh, people like that, and, and the Samaritan woman at the well, who lived this really awful, adulterous life, to be honest with you, and Jesus knew all about it, and yet he would spend time talking to her, ministering to her. And she came to believe in Christ and came to know him because of that. He would spend time with people who were unbelievers, he would build bridges of kindness, of love, and speak truth into their lives. And so our close friends, I believe, are people who need to keep you strong in the Lord. Uh, Corinthians talks about, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You know what? That goes more than just the person we're married to. I'm so happy that I married uh, my wonderful bride there, Carrie Lynn. And this month we're celebrating actually 28 years of marriage, so hard to believe. They look at her, oh, your wife's so pretty, and they look at me and say, yeah, okay, whatever, man. you've got a rough life. It's not been good to you, though. Life's been too good to me, maybe that's the problem. So, uh, the reality is, though, that we're called to, to love one another and to model that to one another. So, our close friends, the people you marry, your close associates, people that you spend time with that are going to speak in your life, I believe as Christians, you need to have fellow Christians. In fact, that's what the Bible talks about. But they shouldn't be your only friends because we're called to go and make disciples. Go and shine our light. Build bridges. Make friends with people who don't know God so that hopefully one day they will know God. They will know Jesus as their Lord. And have a good testimony with unbelievers. Go shine your light. Finally this morning, number three. A Christian leader is bold in the faith. A Christian leader should be bold in the faith. And maybe you say, Pastor Scott, to be honest with you, that's not really me. You know, I have a trouble just, you know, telling people that I go to church or if they ask me what I believe, you know, I have trouble even telling them I'm a Christian. I mean, we can be honest about that. But here's the deal. If you want more boldness, you need to get into the Word. Prayer, praise, and the power of the Word. The Apostle Paul tells us that Christian service helps us to become bold as we grow and mature in the Lord. So that once you start doing this, I want to do something for God. I don't want to just be the person that's, you know, going to church once a week and and maybe sporadically I crack the Bible open here and there and read. I want to be somebody who not only is fed, but is helping to feed others. I want to contribute. I want to use whatever gifts God has given to help build His kingdom. So you start serving. You find ways to serve. You will grow when you are serving. That helps you to grow and mature because all of a sudden you're being used. And you're ministering to others. And you get out there to start doing it. Years ago, Nike had a slogan that said, just do it. You guys remember that? Just do it, right? And, of course, you know, Michael Jordan was a huge, huge uh, um, endorsement for Nike and, and the Nike Airs and all that stuff. But basically, that's, again, from a Greek term. And, and, and the idea is get out there and start doing Just go for it. You might stumble. You might fall. But you will learn in the process. You will grow. You will develop. You will mature. And, in fact, when you look at Hebrews, you know, if you've heard that scripture about the meat and the milk. Some of you guys have been to church for a while. Maybe your Sunday school teachers told you that. Uh, you know, you should be on meat right now. You're still on milk. Like you're a baby Christian. Like a newborn baby, they drink milk. And then when you get older, um, you start eating meat and things. And, and uh, when our kids were young, just like any kids, we fed them the Gerber baby food. And Gerber's good stuff. And sweet potatoes and turkey. That was a mixture that they had for whatever reason. And our son Coulter, I remember he liked sweet potatoes and turkey. I forgot what you liked, Spence. Sorry, but I'm sure you liked it all. But um, <laughs> Coulter, and I even made up a song that went along with that. And then when he got older, then he started giving them like solid food, right? And, but Hebrew says, you're still baby Christians. And it was kind of a little chastisement to this group of Christians that were still really immature. They should have been growing and learning and developing. And it says, how do you get on the meat? Is it something that magically happens? No, it says, these are those who by constant use have learned to discern good and evil. In other words, by applying what they learn, we learn the Bible, but now we start to live it. I'm going to choose to live this. Okay, grace, I need to show grace. Forgiveness, I need to forgive even my enemies. That's tough, but I'm going to try it with God's help. Okay, faithfulness, righteousness. I want to apply the principles 
and, and start to serve others and start to serve, use my gifts to, to reach out to others, to the lost. And through constant use, they get off of the milk and they get on the meat. See, they grow up and learn by doing it. It's like riding a bike, right? When you first start to ride, you're going to stumble, you're going to fall. But the more you ride, the better you get, the more confident, stronger, and competent you get on that bicycle. To Pretty soon you're going off jumps and you're going on dirt trails and all kinds of cool stuff. So through constant use, we grow, we mature. And that's how we get bold in the faith, to start doing it. Just do it. God will help you. He's there with you. He will guide and direct you. But we need to choose to put action to our faith. Because James says, faith without works is dead. But show me your faith, and I will show you my faith through the works that I do. I'm going to put action to my faith, and I'm going to grow to become more like Jesus every day. So the Apostle Paul tells us that Christian service helps us to become bold as we grow and mature in the Lord. Being bold in the faith doesn't mean that we are self-assured in our own abilities. It doesn't make you cocky. It doesn't mean you get to be prideful or a jerk. Rather, being bold in the faith is a firm understanding that Jesus Christ is the all-powerful Lord, that He lives in us by His Holy Spirit, and that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, right? So our boldness comes in the fact that God is great, and He is on our side, and He lives in us by His Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. And 1 John 4, 4, 4, you guys have heard this, Greater is He that is in you, that's the Holy Spirit, amen, than He that is in the world. God is greater, and He lives in you. Praise the Lord.